When you watch any footage of a well-known VR shooter, have you noticed how it looks remarkably similar to flat-screen first-person shooter gameplay? Only, the graphics and animations tend to be worse and far jankier on the VR side. I'm talking about how the players behave. How, despite having a dramatically different input method that offers unparalleled freedom on one side compared to the other, a VR player will still behave almost identically to a flat-screen player. Only ever shooting where they're looking, aiming down sights 24-7 for all engagements, perpetually sprinting mindlessly from one encounter to the next, sliding around the map in that gamey way we have been doing for decades now, while exploiting strafe spamming non-stop as they aim down sights while holding cover. All of the same boring, tedious behaviour every flat-screen shooter eventually comes down to, all being repeated by VR players. It's actually far worse in VR by comparison. Flat-screen shooters at least have clear trade-offs and consequences to consider when it comes to movement, aiming, and reloading. If you sprint, you usually can't aim or shoot. Low readying a weapon and firing while moving normally comes with an accuracy penalty, and aiming down sights while moving normally causes at least a little bit of weapon sway. And reloading comes with the clear amount of downtime to consider, defined by the animation that happens. These are there to vaguely mimic the true-to-life consequences, which, ironically, the same is not true in VR shooters, even though it has the much more realistic input. You never see any weapon sway happen in VR, no matter how fast the character is moving or turning. A VR player can transition from walking to sprinting without any consequences whatsoever, they just need to point the barrel of their weapon down a touch. Even reloads can be entirely skipped or cheesed because of how lenient and forgiving the implementations normally are, allowing you to vaguely hover your hand in a general area, press a button, release a button, and then you're done. Which can be quickly turned into a very swift movement, negating the entire consequence of reloading. The most potentially realistic input turns into the least realistic. Essentially, our bodies are now the controllers in VR, so you would think there would be much more human-like behaviour being demonstrated in moment-to-moment -moment play. Even things like blind fire, which is seldom done in flat screen but is a native ability with VR motion, is almost never seen in gameplay. People just don't bother to do it. It's strange to me because, when you think about it, isn't one of the main appeals of playing a VR version that you break free from the button presses and your own physical self becomes the controller? What's the point in motion controllers being invented if that wasn't the case? We would have been fine sticking to mouse and keyboard and console controllers while wearing the headset otherwise. So what are we doing with these design choices? I think VR shooters can and should be better, and infinitely more interesting than how they currently play out. I believe that if the same game were to have a flat screen and VR as two separate versions, that despite being the same title, they should play out fundamentally different from one another. It all comes down to how the core mechanics are designed, and how they incentivize the player to engage with them, or not. Because right now, devs are designing their shooters with flat-screen principles that actively disincentivize the use of motion input beyond the absolute shallow minimum. I think this is a problem for VR gaming, a waste of potential, and I hope you agree. So this is my video doctrine, so to speak, on how to fix this problem. Here are my proposed core pillars of design changes that will make VR shooters start taking better advantage of the medium's potential. The guiding principle being that they will incentivize players to prefer doing things physically over virtually, and that this will lead to an experience which feels and looks significantly more engaging for them and spectators, while creating natural, interesting gameplay balances from the consequences of using our bodies more. I'll explain each one in more detail afterwards. They are, number one, virtual movement acceleration from zero to 100 should be greatly slowed down. Number two, movement needs to come with more consequences to gunplay. And number three, gun interactions should be made stricter and require much more accuracy to be successful. To put it simply, the reason we never care to physically move is because virtual movement is too good and too easy. It's quickly obvious how much more efficient and consequence-free it is compared to real-life movement. If we lean or take a small step to aim around a corner physically, we are subject to physics and inertia. 
the delay of our muscles adjusting and moving from one pose to another, having to readjust and reacquire our aim, all of this taking real time and deliberate effort that needs us to pay attention and physically maneuver around our surroundings. And then of course we are much slower to react to things happening with our entire bodies, compared to just slightly moving our thumbs to achieve the same effect instead. If we are allowed to almost instantly accelerate from 0 to 100 by leaning our thumb slightly, and sprint and slide around an environment at high speeds while keeping our weapon completely still and ready to go, then we are going to prefer that, aren't we? We are going to exploit these flat screen norms and put in the minimum effort for maximal results. Given the choice, humans will take the path of least resistance whenever possible, so we're not going to opt for the very real, very human consequences that physical movement comes with, even if doing so would likely lead to the most interesting, immersive and engaging virtual experiences we've ever had. So to get us to where we hope to be, virtual movement acceleration should be slowed significantly but not so that it becomes obnoxious when looking to travel longer distances. A sensible balance must be struck. It should be just limited and slow enough that when a short, quick, reactive movement is required, like leaning, ducking, jumping, and changing strafe direction in response to something happening, the player will naturally opt to do that physically. A similar implementation should also apply to virtual turning though lesser with acceleration and more with the maximum allowed speed. Smooth turn can have a bit of acceleration, much less so than moving, but have its max turn speed capped to a point that it's intuitively preferable and more effective for the player to turn physically when needing to turn small amounts or make quicker, snappier turns in response to something happening. Snap turn needs a bit more finesse to deal with, I think at present snap turn is highly abused. It looks terrible and disorienting as a spectator, and in a multiplayer context, seeing your allies and enemies snap their facing around in a single frame looks super jank. In many cases, being unfair because reading and reacting to movement cues then becomes impossible. And of course, there are no consequences to this in virtual reality. Just hold your weapon still, then snap instantly to face somewhere without any disruption to your aim. It's no good. I propose that snap turn angles should be limited to only a single option, 90 degrees. The idea being that any needed turning underneath this angle is small enough to be done physically, even when you're sitting. Despite its name, snap turning should not be instant. There should be a standardized delay in finishing the turn which is always a little bit slower than the average person physically turning the same degrees, with a little bit of physical urgency. During the snap turn transition, the screen should fade or blur in and out to emulate the consequence of needing to briefly refocus the scene, reorient our bodies, and reacquire a target as we have to when physically turning, to lessen the advantage of not having to do that when virtually snap turning. The same would be applied to virtual crouching, which should be slower and more delayed than a reactive physical equivalent, and of course be given a cooldown between transitions to prevent abuse in multiplayer situations. For competitive multiplayer scenarios, this would also allow for an actual turning animation to occur in a third-person perspective that remains in sync with what the player sees, and doesn't look like pure jank. I understand it's also there for motion sickness reasons, so it would be premature to eliminate this method entirely, but it needs to start coming with trade-offs. And it seems to be the case that the more a player is required to physically engage, the less they are stricken by motion sickness, because the physical response matching up better to the visual helps the brain to accept what's happening. So for this reason too, we should aspire to encourage more physicality. Movement in a VR shooter has next to no meaningful consequences at the moment, with players for too long being able to have their cake and eat it. With how things are now, their guns and arms may as well exist in a completely different dimension, ignoring anything else that happens and results in players treating VR shooters more like a light gun or on-rails shooter game instead. Luckily, there is a solution to this which has existed for many years but has been left mostly unexplored. 
One that, with some focused refining and iteration from dedicated developers up to the task, can work in harmony with the principles of engaging physicality that take proper advantage of motion controls. Arm Swinger Movement Now I don't like calling this Arm Swinger, because for those who have tried it in past iterations, there are large downsides which seem insurmountable, and so will immediately dismiss it. The words arm swinger, I feel, also invokes an undesirable image of behavior to the average user, which is unappealing or silly. So, from now on, I am renaming this to Controller Motion Movement. Rather than just explain, I think it's best I also show with my own actions. So let's go to a live demonstration from Future Me. Here is how the current implementation of Arm Swinger works. Both of the thumbsticks will turn your character, left or right controller. You can press a button on either controller to allow your character to move forward virtually. I'm pressing the right button at the moment. You keep that held, you move forward. The same with the left. You can press them both at the same time to move faster, combining the speed. The speed can be set on the options. If you wish to increase the speed, swing your arms back and forth. It will average the speed of, of the swing on both controllers. If I do it on only one, I'll move slower, but on both, I'll move faster. You can get a kind of momentum, but if you swing too much, you can see that I'm swaying from side to side. It's a decent method and quite enjoyable to do, but it has made a downside, which is why it hasn't caught on. One of those downsides being that it's very hard to strafe when using a weapon. If I want to strafe right, I need to take my left wrist and twist it rightwards and hold the button, and begin to turn virtually or in real life in order to circle a target. The same with the other hand. Twist it left in order to strafe left. If I'm holding a weapon, having to twist my wrist, as you can see, causes problems. It also makes it nearly impossible to move backwards whilst using a weapon. You can if you twist your wrist awkwardly and then swing but as you can see, that is impractical. It's a touch better when using a one-handed weapon, but you can imagine if I want to strafe leftwards whilst holding a weapon in my right hand, then I'm gonna have to do this. It's no good. So I think it's clear why that implementation hasn't quite caught on or been developed on. My suggestion is that we retain the ability to move virtually, as usual. However, if we wish to move at higher speeds, be it a jog or a sprint, then we have to incorporate controller motion movement in some manner, depending on the object that we are holding and the situation. So, say this is a light jog I'm going at presently. I cannot press a button to sprint, but if I start to move my hands in motion as if I wanted to sprint, then I would accelerate naturally into a sprint speed. If I'm holding a weapon, such as a rifle, then, rather than point the barrel downwards and press a button to move at an instant sprint, I instead would have to incorporate a natural sway motion, and then, once I cross a threshold which the game is programmed to detect, I can then sprint. The beauty of this method, of course, is that it naturally balances itself. No more can I just move around very fast with a, with a completely stable aim. If I wish to move fast, I have to choose to sacrifice my ability to aim instead, just like in a flat screen game. So I can no longer just point the barrel down, turn virtually or physically, and then be ready immediately. I instead have to mime the action as I would in real life. And if I wish to suddenly stop, and then take aim, then I have to readjust myself completely naturally and physically and, and acquire the target that way. It balances itself without any need for developer intervention. You could also incorporate a form of minigame into the act of achieving a higher speed. For example, we have footsteps, and when we are moving at a faster speed, if we sway the controller in line with how our footsteps are landing on the floor, then we could be able to maintain a higher top speed compared to someone who is recklessly moving without any kind of rhythm matching with their character's pace. You may be concerned that this method could be activated accidentally. This is easily avoidable and solvable. So, 
If I wish to go up to a sprinting or faster pace, then rather than only moving my controllers in motion, I would have to hold a modifier button. In the case of holding a one-handed object, I could press and hold the trigger on the offhand in order to allow myself to go up to a sprint. But there's another problem with this, in that it can be quite cumbersome and annoying to maintain a button hold when swaying your arms back and forth, especially if that involves using the thumbstick. We can solve this by implementing a threshold into the movement in which, after I attain a certain speed or start sprinting, I can let go of that modifier button that tells the game I want to sprint, and so long as I keep my controllers moving, moving in rhythm, then I will maintain that speed. And if I begin to slow down or go below a certain threshold of swaying the controllers, then I will, with a natural acceleration curve that makes sense, slow down or stop entirely. If I wish to move from this cover to the pillar over there, presently, I just point the barrel down or the weapon down, press a button and I'm immediately there. With my method, it becomes much more involved, much more physical, and because included with my prior suggestion of much slower acceleration, it means that I have to take a much more dedicated and conscious approach to movement, thus involving myself more physically, doing more physical things, yada yada yada. Going into the technicalities of this, it can be based upon whether the object is swaying in front of you, or you can incorporate different poses, such as holding the rifle up to one shoulder and moving the other hand in order to activate a sprint or a faster pace of movement. And there we go. With the implementation of control and motion movement, we have essentially solved many balancing issues that we currently have in VR, and we are incorporating physical motion, getting the player involved in the game more, and making better use of the six degrees of freedom. One thing will lead to another. The more physical that we are, the more that we will be inclined to be physical in other actions. The end game that all flat screen shooters come down to as the dominating skills which determine success are positioning and reflex aim. All done via pressing an on or off button. Everything else, reloading, ability and item usage, methods of movement, no matter how flashy or complex they look to pull off, all of them are reduced down to an aim, press and forget single button abstraction. This has been true since the dawn of computer gaming, I think, and it makes sense considering the inputs we had. I'm incredibly bored and uninterested by this routine now. Nor am I any longer particularly impressed by, or regard highly, a player's competence at tapping buttons and keys while sliding their perfectly stable mouse a few inches around, or twiddling their heavily aim-assisted thumbsticks. I feel this is an incredibly narrow skill set that works only in favour of an even narrower percentage of the demographic, while everyone else, who may have other skills which could set them apart, but clicking and pressing binary buttons could never have them realise, are left out in the dust and not represented in any way. There are so many nuances of skill expression that our bodies and entire being could show in a shooter scenario beyond just positioning and aim. So many variables in the equation to make moment-to-moment -moment play so much more interesting, diverse, and allowing for brand new avenues of success. Virtual reality has the potential to enable a whole new skill set to enter the arena through physical and psychological diversity, but we can only allow those to emerge by going against common sense flat screen design. Reloading a gun is a great example of a common action that can become a nuanced skill check in VR to make things more interesting and satisfying. I think it's best once again for me to give a live demonstration. As I mentioned earlier in the video, reloads are something that can be cheesed very easily in VR, so I'm calling for things to be much more precise, akin to how it is in H3 VR, the only VR game that I've played which adheres to firearm interactions being much stricter, and thus requiring a level of skill and finesse from the player in order to successfully perform them, especially under pressure. At the moment, you have to be very, very, very precise with how 
You insert magazines. Now, I don't think that things should be quite as strict as this. I think there should be a little bit more leniency. However, what we have here in H3VR should be used as a base template and a nice middle ground should be found. These interaction spheres are also incredibly precise. I think, at the very least, these interaction spheres should be doubled in size or perhaps by 1.5 times. Again, we want precision, but still more leniency than what H3VR offers. And a similar level of finesse needed for things like rifles, which in itself looks fantastic and feels very satisfying to do. I'd like you to imagine for a moment that there is a firefight happening between two players of roughly equal skill, one of whom is a better aim than the other. They have both failed to kill each other and now they both need to reload at the same time. In traditional shooter terms, you would just press a button and reload would happen. The player with a better aim will win that encounter most of the time. But in VR, with the freedom of movement, the six degrees, rotation, all of that stuff, the skill of remaining calm and reloading can become a serious player in determining who wins that encounter. Now, the other player is a better aim than me, say, but I have a skill at remaining incredibly calm and precise and fast when it comes to doing my reloads. So the magazine goes in, the bolt goes back, and I'm ready to go. But the other player, who is a very good aim compared to me, but is not good at staying calm and reloading under pressure, they fail and fumble and stumble with trying to get the magazine in. Whereas I'm already good to go, I take aim and I successfully defeat that player. This is just one example of the numerous little skill expressions that can be brought into play when it comes to shooters in VR, if we make the interactions far stricter. And this will usher in a new era of gaming interaction and relevance of skill sets beyond the stagnant skill sets that we have for flat screen, which I believe will make it more interesting, dramatic and creative for player and spectator alike. And as I keep on saying, one thing will lead to another. Here's a summary of my argument and solutions up to now. Six degrees of freedom motion controls are being wasted and only utilized to the bare minimum of what they could be. This is because VR developers are leaning too heavily on flat screen design philosophies combined with a reluctance to encourage more motion during gameplay. This results in shallow VR gaming experiences which sacrifice what is special about the medium to poorly imitate flat screen trends instead. And this contributes to the lack of design innovation and outside user interest, leading to the cyclical stagnation of VR gaming. My proposed solution is to necessitate more physical user input as a base standard, with the idea that this will jumpstart a momentum of innovation, immersion, and deeper player expression, with the side effect of attracting more users to the medium. This can be achieved by going against some established design trends we're used to in flat screen gaming and accepting that VR motion control, by the very nature of the word motion, is a physical first input. In the case of the semi-realistic shooter genre covered in this video, we can begin the evolution by significantly slowing down initial virtual movement acceleration and restricting virtual turning options. We can do this by creating a gameplay environment where it is more efficient for users to perform short, quick movement gestures physically rather than virtually, to encourage more diverse, creative and natural uses of Six Degrees of Freedom. By enforcing meaningful consequences when moving at faster paces virtually in ways that play to the strengths of 6DOF motion. This can be achieved by requiring the user with their motion controllers to physically mime the poses and rhythm needed for higher speed movement in order to have that faster pace of movement occur in game and by allowing for subtle virtual weapon sway when virtually moving and aiming at slower speeds. This solution would greatly enhance immersion, requires little physical effort, and by the nature of our biology, will balance out so many gameplay factors by themselves, without the need for developer input. And of course, all playing to the strengths and freedom offered by 6DOF Motion.
And lastly, by requiring more accuracy and precision with firearm interactions from the user. This would allow for more player skill, expressions and creativity to enter the gameplay equation, greatly diversifying and refreshing the shooter arena. And it further plays to the strengths of 60OF motion and moves gunplay away from gamey abstractions which reward players for cheap abuse rather than genuine ability. Everything must begin with our mindset. And in this case, if we want things to change and improve, then it should begin with a mindset of rebellion. Long-time established conventions of basic design, which we'd normally always include in our games without thought, must now have their suitability questioned when making a VR game. We should carefully scrutinize whether mechanics that have been considered good common sense design for flat screen might actually be bad for VR when we imagine how we want the player to interact with motion controls, and if necessary, actively design against traditional conventional wisdom. Things as basic as how you implement virtual movement responsiveness can be a crucial factor in how much a player does or doesn't engage with physical motion and all the extra nuances that can lead to. Virtual reality input is a different beast. It uses the analog nature of our bodies, a reversal of flat screen design philosophy in many ways. A philosophy whose end goal for input has always been to abstract as much as it possibly can down to a single binary button press. So we need to undo the flat screen mindset and start to think of how we can exploit VR motion to unabstract things where possible. And we need to have the confidence in why this would be a desirable outcome to begin with. Perhaps most vitally, as this is a brand new paradigm for everyone, we need to properly, thoroughly communicate our design intent to the player step by step through contextual practice and reward in the game. And do not expect the player to work it out by themselves. Don't be afraid to force players out of their comfort zones. We often don't know how good something can be for us until we're forced to engage with it in context. Whenever people publicly seek to do something against the norm, the masses will often condemn and reject this reflexively. Thoughtless herd mentality is still very much alive and well in our species, especially online. Be vigilant with the pushback you receive, particularly from anonymous internet strangers. Consider who they are, if you can, and what motivates their reactions before deciding how trustworthy or seriously they are to be taken. And remember that we can't make something for everyone. Trying to do this only gives the blandest, most uninteresting results that, in the end, no one will really care for. Some people won't be able to participate in your game for various reasons. This is nature and something we can never completely account for. But don't let that fact get in the way of attempting to push interesting innovations either. I hope these explanations have been convincing enough and sold you on why these design choices would lead to much more interesting and engaging gameplay scenarios than we currently get in VR. Ones which would spearhead the creation of an environment that starts to properly use the input and fosters the next stage of gaming evolution we all came to virtual reality for. Especially if you feel similar to me. Bored of the stagnant, mechanically predictable, limited ways traditional shooter design has been bound to, and are also, like me, deeply saddened to see this design trend persist with VR motion, where it turns gaming's greatest innovation since the leap from 2D to 3D into shallow, wasted potential of what it could clearly be. I want to reiterate that I no longer find it impressive or stimulating to have gameplay devolve down to who is best at spamming keys to exploit some aspect of the design, especially in flat-screen multiplayer shooters which feel less and less like playing against dynamic humans and more like bots algorithmically going through the same tired routines of optimal button spamming. We've clearly hit the limits of what we can do with traditional inputs. And we are crazy to try and have those limits also be imposed on VR. Virtual reality is a clear and obvious liberation from this stagnation. 
the next logical step in interactive media. A new frontier, the fantasy of being truly within the world come true, and all of that cheesy stuff. VR is inevitable for our societies, one way or another. An evolution that has unfortunately emerged during a time of profound creative bankruptcy, choking risk-averse corporatization of our art forms, and social demoralization and division, particularly in English-speaking Western cultures, who are the ones mostly helming VR development. So, it's taking much longer than we hope for it to really catch on. On flat screen, if my suggestions were to be implemented there, would feel clunky and awful, and everyone would probably rightfully hate it. But remember that this is VR. Our bodies are the controllers now. It requires an opposite approach in many ways. And all of those restrictions are deliberately in place for players to naturally and easily solve by encouraging and rewarding physical movement, which we, as designers, understand will lead to a better play experience. I believe we actually want these consequences much of the time. Our very natural biology inclines us to be engaged by using our bodies in fun and challenging contexts. And I think the prospect of real-life physical consequences becoming a part of the game is what attracted many people to VR when they learned about how the input works. That it would be a breath of fresh air from being hunched over a desk, slowly developing back problems and carpal tunnel syndrome in your wrists, repetitively using a device that was made for a typewriter just to participate in the stagnant, samey, flat-screen gameplay. It's about THE fantasy of really being in the game, and is why it wasn't enough in the early days of virtual reality to only have the headset without any motion controls. Please do back me up in the comments section if this was true for you. And we're also not excluding those who cannot physically move much for whatever reason, but making it clear that VR motion is a physical first input, and choosing to avoid being physical will come with less optimal results. Consider this video one random stranger's tiny little droplet of contribution into the river that may one day break through the dam halting VR progress to where we want it to be. Hello again everyone, it is future me doing a separate recording. I feel there's a need for clarification after going through the script, so I'm doing this live without any notes. Go me. I want to address some of the obvious things, which some of you may think, in opposition to what I've said, factors such as these things being dependent on how you want the game to play. Now, these principles are by no means what I want to see happen for every single VR shooter game. There is, of course, always room for variation. It depends on what you're going for, how fast you want it to be, whether it's more realistic or not, whether it's single player, multiplayer, all of that stuff. So I want to stress here that I do not want this to be dogmatic for every single VR shooter. Only that these principles, I believe, will enable us to adopt a more physical mindset and one thing will lead to another. But of course, if you're making a more classic, fast-paced arena shooter where realism and those physical consequences are not really something that you care for, you want it to be more fantastical, yada yada yada, then yeah, use more flat screen design principles. And I also think that maybe a few of you will say, I want VR to usurp flat screen gaming entirely. I believe it will inevitably be preferable to be in a VR version of a game than see it on a screen, but there is plenty of room for VR and flat screen to exist side by side. I don't believe that every gaming experience should be a very physical and active one. There is great joy to be had from lounging on a sofa or sitting on a chair playing a game passively. So I want to stress that. I want to stress that there is plenty of room for these methods of play to coexist side by side. And I want to clarify my meaning of movement in VR too. Now, I worry that when I talk about moving around more that I invoke the sense that I want us to be diving around our play spaces, and some of you may object and think, oh, well, I don't have that big of a play space, I can barely move, blah 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 blah. That's not my meaning at all. When I say movement, I literally mean just taking a little step around where you're standing here and there, and physically turning more, and crouching down something which you should be able to do if you are playing VR standing. 
if you are in an environment where you can't even outstretch your arms halfway and attempting to play VR, then that is on you. You should not be playing in that environment. So, yes, when I say movement, I mean turning physically, leaning physically, and taking a step here and there physically, not diving around the play space. It would be wonderful if we all could do that, and I would love to, but yeah. I also think that some of you may be tempted to protest needing to turn and move physically. For whatever reason, you would prefer to play a physical medium unphysically. So the choice is still there. I don't wish to eradicate virtual movement entirely, that wouldn't be fair. But if you go into a physical input medium, not wanting to move whatsoever, then all I can say is, what's wrong with you? <laughs> Why don't you want to move even a little bit, even if it's just leaning or turning? Movement by itself, the way that our bodies are designed and the way that nature has built us, is that we are naturally engaged by moving. We are rewarded by moving and using our bodies. We're given natural chemicals and dopamine and rewarded for making use of these bodies that we have. So if you have a great aversion to wanting to have any movement at all, then VR is not for you. And I'd recommend going to see a doctor or something, because if you don't want to move at all, something's wrong. And also on the topic of movement itself, there are things that we have a resistance to doing at the moment, such as crouching down to pick up things in VR. Something that has been alleviated by implementations like teleportation grab. It's very important to note that our bodies have inertia and momentum. So if you were standing and playing a VR game now, standing up straight, barely moving, only moving your arms up and down to aim a weapon, when you encounter an item that you need to pick up off the floor, it feels cumbersome, annoying, irritating to do, so you would naturally think, oh, I want it automated for me. The reason why it's difficult and undesirable to do a simple action like bending down is because your body is not already moving in a rhythmical way to get momentum. If we are naturally much more physical and in motion moment to moment through play, such as moving our arms a little bit more, leaning and taking steps, then because our bodies are already engaged and in motion, so to speak, then the act of bending down to pick something up will instantly become much more acceptable and not a bother at all. I challenge you to try this with any VR game you presently own. Move around in the virtual world, but I want you to mime your arm movements as if you were actually in the world and turn more physically. And keep on moving your arms in line with what feels natural with how fast you're moving in the virtual world. You will recognize that when it comes to bending down and picking things up or having to adjust your pose, it becomes so much easier because you're already warmed up. One thing will lead to another. And finally, I want to go back to what I feel may be an impulsive and innate resistance to the idea of having to move even a little bit more in VR. Alongside what I just said earlier, I would ask you to really think about why you are resistant to that to begin with. When you, when you hear the idea of needing to move around a bit more and you have that reflexive, oh, I don't want to, why should I? I invite you to consider where is that impulse coming from? What is that resistance born from? Why does the idea of having to move your body more, one of the most natural and intuitive things that is part of having these bodies, why are you resistant to that? Has that idea been seeded from something else that you heard or learnt before? Are you actually truly thinking for yourself why you wouldn't like it? Or are you just reacting thoughtlessly? We are all vulnerable to hive mind thinking and being socially influenced in ways that we don't realize. It happens to me plenty of times. But really stop and think, why am I resistant to having to use my body a little bit more? Where is that coming from? Why is it so bad to me? And maybe that will take you to an interesting place and you'll come to learn more about yourself and be willing to try more things. Okay, that's everything that I can think of. If you made it all the way to the end of this video, thank you very much for your patience and your time. And also a personal thank you to my patrons, whose collective generosity remains the reason that I am still here making these videos. Thank you so much. See you next time.